One of the most beautiful and moving stories in the entire Bible is the story of Ruth. It is set in a very dark and precarious time in Israelite history, and it's a story that is meant to inspire hope and light in the midst of darkness. So we're gonna look at this story from a number of different angles, trying to get a sense for what's going on here. And in this episode, we're looking at the first five verses that form a foundation for how the rest of the story emerges. Friends, hello there. Welcome to this brand new series that we are doing on the book of Ruth, this spectacular story that comes in a very precarious time in Israelite history. And Brad and I are gonna be doing six parts on this. And for just part one here, I'm gonna be looking at the first five verses, which means for subsequent episodes, we're gonna be tackling a lot more because there are four chapters to the book of Ruth. But these first five verses set the context for this entire story. And so notice how it begins. In the days when the judges ruled, that is getting off to a fast start. But again, it is a dark start because the period of the judges is a dark, dark period in Israelite history. So in the Protestant canon of our Bibles, Judges comes right before the book of Ruth. But Ruth is set during the time of the book of Judges. And when you look at the book of Judges, many of you will know there is this cycle that is happening all throughout the book. And it begins with there is obedience by God's people. There is peace in the land all is well. But then God's people forget God. They sin. And as a result of that, God allows an oppressor to come onto the scene. The people experience oppression. And in the midst of their oppression, they cry out to God. God hears their cry. He raises up a deliverer who rescues the people. They go back to obedience and peace. And then the cycle continues. And you see this through the book of Judges. And then you come to the last five chapters, beginning in Judges 17, and it starts arguably some of the ugliest, bloodiest, most depraved chapters in the entire Bible. And it begins in chapter 17, verse six, and then it concludes with the exact same passage that you have in Judges 17, six. In those days, there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. And yet, in the midst of that, we have this story of Ruth. And so in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. Not only is this a tough time period for the entire country, but there's also a famine in the land. And when you put the famine next to in the days when the judges rule, to anyone who is a perceptive reader of the text will go, oh, this harkens back to what Moses was doing when he shared with the people the blessings and curses that God said would come upon them if they lived in obedience or if they chose to live another way. And in Deuteronomy 28, one of the things God says is that if you are living in disobedience to me, there will be famine in the land. That God would use famine to get the people to recognize where they are at and how they have fallen away and what they need to do to repent and to come back into right relationship with God. And so as the story continues, we've got a famine in the land and then we're told that in a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Now, for those of you who've been following Walking the Text for any length of time, will know that geography matters a great deal. We always want to figure out where are we on a map, what's going on, how is that helping us to better understand the context of the story, and we actually have two locations that are referenced here. We have Bethlehem and we have Moab. Now, we have a, a town or a village or a city in Bethlehem, and Moab is a region. It's, it's more of a country. 
And so, first of all, recognize that this story deals with a man of Bethlehem during a time of famine, which is a bit ironic when you recognize that the name Bethlehem in Hebrew is Beit Lechem, which literally translates house of bread. So in the house of bread, there is no bread. And now you have a man of Bethlehem who is looking to go to Moab. So on a map here, Bethlehem sits up in the high hill country and Moab is just across the way. Now, technically there are three parts to Moab. This is known as the plains of Moab. This is the Medaba Plateau, but the heartland of Moab is sitting here straight to the southeast of Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem today is a bustling area because this is where Jesus was born. But back in the ancient times, it was a very small town or village. So you have a family that is living in Bethlehem, and it says that they went to sojourn in Moab. Now, one of the questions we have to ask is, is well, if they're experiencing a famine over here, and this is maybe 35 to 50 miles, depending upon where you're looking, how do they know that things are well in Moab and that Moab isn't experiencing famine like they're experiencing right here. This is not very far apart. Well, the answer comes in what we call a view shed. What can you see from a distance? With Accordance Bible Software, you can choose a particular area and then you can render it into three dimensions. And then you can actually zoom in, move around, get a sense for where we're at. So Bethlehem is up in the high hill country, and if you start to see kind of a, a horizontal profile, you can see it sits way up, and then you have the drop down into the Rift Valley, and then the rise up to Moab. And if you rotate this all the way around and you get the viewpoint from Bethlehem, you can see because it sits so high up, you can clearly see all the way across to the southeast to the region of Moab. And on even a more technical map called a viewshed, if you're in Bethlehem looking again to that southeast, everything in yellow is what you can see of Moab if you are standing in Bethlehem. The reason why, and we're going to find out his name is Elimelech or Elimelech, goes to Moab is because literally the grass is greener on the other side. They can see anywhere from 35 to 50 miles and they see that the land is doing well and they leave. Now, the two most important things in the ancient world are your land and your family. And the fact that they are going to leave heartland of Israel to go to a foreign country is problematic in the story. In fact, a brilliant scholar by the name of Daniel Block says it this way. Instead of dealing with root causes, they reacted to symptoms. Instead of recognizing the famine to be punishment for the nation's sin and repenting of their spiritual infidelity, they left their people and their land for the unclean land of Moab. So it's not that they just left, it's actually where they went to. And when the Israelites were on the east side of the Jordan River Valley, getting ready to cross into the promised land under the conquest, you have the king of Moab, a guy by the name of Balak, who hires Balaam to come and to curse the Israelites. He actually can't curse them, he blesses them. But collectively they hatch a plan to send in a bunch of Moabite temple prostitutes to create a mess among the Israelites, and it happened. And you can read about this in the book of Numbers. And so as a result of that, in Deuteronomy, we have this reference that no Ammonite or Moabite shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord, even to the 10th generation, none of their descendants shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. Now, in a forthcoming episode that Brad Nelson's gonna be doing, he'll go into greater detail about the Moabites and this predicament, but just recognize it's not just leaving the land that's problematic to anybody who's reading this story or hearing it told, it's where they went as well. But they go, they left and they went to the land of Moab. 
And then we see that again, he goes with his wife and his two sons. And by the way, notice all of that was just in verse one. Everything we've talked about for the last 10 minutes is in verse one. Now we move to the next verse. The name of the man was Elimelech or Elimelech and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Machlon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. Now, one of the things to recognize is that names are gonna play an important part in the story of Ruth. And so just what's in a name, we are giving four names here. And Elimelech, or again, Elimelech, that's the Hebrew there, means my God is king. Naomi, or Naomi, means pleasant one. Machlon and Kilion, this is gonna surprise you, but Machlon means sickly, and Kilion means weakly. Now, if you know anything about naming in the ancient world, is that you would name your children based on either a couple of factors. One, who you wanted them to be. Like, what did you pray for them to be their future reality? And, and you would name them something accordingly. Uh, another way would be something just about their character that maybe you feel like they're going to possess. But in other cases, you actually named your child based on their condition when they were born. Now, we don't know why in the world they would have received these names, but clearly there was something physically wrong with both of them that it actually was played out in their name and how their parents gave them these particular names. So we've got this going on here, and then it moves on after we are given those names that we're told, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. This is what you call an economy of words. We are not told, how he died, we aren't told why he died, we're not given any details, and as straightforward as the writer can be, he died. And Naomi is now relegated to a widow. And being a widow in the ancient world was very, very precarious on its own term. You often didn't have any kind of social status, economic status, political status, but what her saving grace here is in this moment is that she has two sons. Because in the ancient world, a woman's protection and provision came first and foremost from her father. It was then passed over or transferred over to the husband and then from the husband to the sons. Now, almost certainly because we know in the story that Naomi is older in age, her father is probably dead, which means Elimelech was the one who was now her protection and provision, but now he's dead. So that means now it's her sons that are responsible for doing that for her. Her only saving grace is that she has two boys. And then as the narrative continues, these took Moabite wives. Wow, that feels problematic. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other was Ruth. They lived there about 10 years. We're given two more names. Recognize these are Moabite women. They probably have Moabite names, but we are given their names in Hebrew. So we don't know if these were actually their names or if this is more along the, the lines of this is the, the, the name they were given in Hebrew to represent who they were. Um, Orpah and then Ruth, and by the way, Ruth means friend or companion, which is gonna obviously play out in the story as well. Orpah can mean fawn, it can also mean neck. So again, not entirely sure how that one's playing out in the story, but as we'll learn, Orpah doesn't hang around long in the narrative. Naomi's only saving grace is that she has two boys, but then we find out in the very next verse, and both Machlon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Game's over. Like, Naomi's plight could not be any worse. Recognize that in this moment, she has no protection, she has no provision, she likely can't work, she is in a foreign country, she has no rights, 
She can't return to her parents' house. Why? They're probably dead. What's more, she is without land and without family. Now, some of you will know that the rest of the story, somehow she's got some kind of land. Well, according to the Torah, according to the law, and we'll look at this at a later episode, she has no rights to the land that they left when they left Bethlehem. She has nothing, at least it appears in this moment. Kay Lawson Jr. does a great job of just summarizing it this way. Naomi is a stranger in a foreign land, a victim of death and of life. To Naomi, this is not the way she saw her story playing out. And really the overarching theme that we see in these first five verses is this idea of famine. And that for any of our lives, for Naomi's life, for Ruth's life, for Orpah's life for that matter, is that we're not wanting to experience famine. We want to experience flourishing. That in the house of bread, you want to be experiencing bread. You want to be experiencing harvest. You want to be experiencing fullness. You want to be experiencing that sense of joy that things are going well. And yet, in this moment, Naomi finds her life not looking like this, but looking more like this. Where the ground is hard. It is cracked. There seems to be no life bursting through. It is brown. It is laced in shadows. It is bleak. And I would imagine that we can all identify these times and these moments in life where that's us. For some of you who are watching this right now, that's, that's you right now. Uh, maybe for some of us, we unknowingly know that this is going to be our life in the next month or the next six months. And nobody says, ooh, I want that. No, we, we, we want this. But the reality in life is that there are moments where we find ourselves in this kind of landscape. And what I find so challenging about this part of the story is that we have to be willing to acknowledge our famines. And the way that we do so is not sweeping what's going on under the rug or saying it doesn't really matter or it's not really all that important or I should be totally laced in gratitude regardless of what's going on in life. No, one of the most important things is being able to acknowledge where we find ourselves at, hoping that it will not last long, but also reminding ourselves in the midst of it, God is working. And one of the challenges to be reminded of when we're going through famines is to not live into a victim mindset, but to be aware that God is going to work because God works in the midst of challenging circumstances and sometimes it is through the challenging circumstances where we become most aware of what God is up to and what he is like. And we'll talk about that more in the coming episodes, but just for now, recognize that in the midst of acknowledging our famines, we want to name it. That's a way of beginning to deal with it and to recognize that in the midst of it, God is working however difficult it may be able to see in that moment. And so that's part one. There's our foundation, there's our launch pad. And as we continue to move through the rest of this series, we're gonna see how God is actually working. But it is not without pain, it is not without disappointment, it's not without hardship. But in the midst of those famines, God is working and God is moving us from a sense of famine to fullness. But we have to be able to go through the one in order to experience the other. So friends, thanks so much for joining us for part one of Ruth. We're excited about taking you through the rest of the book. And as always, may you walk out the text well in your life.